بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله brothers and sisters respected elders I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every single one of you is well, in good health, with high iman. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep you united and to keep you on Surat al Mustaqeen, the straight path. So, today's topic, I think, is a very top, important topic. It's called dealing with doubts. And the reason is important because we live in a very globalized society. Facebook and Google and Twitter and YouTube has really linked many cultures together and it has spread ideas far and wide. And in this context, it's very important for us to understand that we have a spiritual and intellectual duty to deal with these modern challenges because what's come along with social media has also brought with it fitna and fasad. Now what I mean by fitna and fasad is this kind of tsunami of doubts, tsunami of attacks against Islam. Social, moral, political, ideological attacks. This is almost a fact. You just type in Islam on Google and you'll see it. It's, it's, this is nothing I'm making up. And unfortunately, the social media world has opened what I would call the doors of hell because everyone's lacking adab. There's no adab anymore. There was one sheikh, he was actually complaining about the use of social media and things like YouTube and even the comments. Is that people lack genuine humanity, genuine good akhlaq and adab. Anyway, within this mess, there's been a growing challenge against Islam. And it's not only social media. We have this because post 9-11, there's been an increased focus on the Islamic tradition. There's been an increased focus on the Islamic way of life. And there are huge debates about extremism and fundamentalism and conservative Islam and traditional Islam and moderate Islam and all of these labels, right? And there's a huge debate and discussion going on. But we have to understand that all of this is not new. This is not a new phenomenon. When we read the Quran and the Sunnah, we understand that these challenges existed from the very beginning of Islam. So there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> we've, we've been through this, we've done that, we've won the t-shirt. You know, we have good experience. It's not as if it's a new unprecedented phenomena. All of a sudden people are challenging Islam. It's no big deal, right? We've always stood on the shoulders of giants, the ulama, and they've given us answers. You know what's very interesting about the Islamic tradition? What's very interesting is that our ulama were the ones who were the first to challenge Islam. That's how amazing our tradition is. If you read the works of Razi, read, read the works of Ibn Kathir, you see, they pose a question. And then they give you an answer, right? Because our tradition was always about thinking and doing tadabbur, pondering over the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this process of pondering, in this process of tadabbur, you're going to get questions, right? But the beautiful thing is our ulama had the right fertile soil in order to understand the questions in the correct light and provide answers. Because they had the right fertile soil where a seed was planted, it would grow into the fruits of Iman. It wouldn't grow into a thorny bush, right? And so I don't think we should worry. This is not an unprecedented issue, okay? Read all of our classical works from Ibn Taymiyyah to Al-Ghazali to, to Razi to Qurtubi to Ibn Kathir to... There's a whole list. It goes on and on and on. They answered questions for us whether the questions were about philosophy, whether the questions were about aqidah, whether the questions were about spirituality, whether the questions were about social issues, moral issues, ethical issues, ethical dilemmas. I mean, we have it, it's in our tradition. And we should be proud 
Islamically proud, right? Not ego, not egocentric, but you know, pride. Have a sense of pride that we have an amazing intellectual tradition with ulama that we love and ulama that have actually defended, represented, articulated, and conveyed the Quran and Sunnah throughout the ages. I think our job now is just to access that information and to contemporize it, if there is such a word, to make it contemporary. Because some of the language in the 15th century, some of the language in the 11th century is maybe archaic. Some of its meanings we don't understand. And we just have to basically make it more modern. We don't have to reinvent the Quran and Sunnah. We don't have to reinvent our classical tradition. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. So the whole point of this talk is to do with three things. Number one, to discuss what belief is, right? Because it's important to know what you know before you start doubting anything, right? This reminds me of a famous story. It was a story of Razi. He went into this town and all of his students and all of the, his followers and his admirers were like, oh my God, it's the big Sheikh Razi. And there's this old lady, right? This old pious lady saying, who is this Razi, right? Who is this Razi? And his student was like, oh, shh, don't you know? It's the, bish, it's the big Sheikh. He has a thousand proofs for the existence of Allah. And then she looked at him and said, well, the one who has a thousand proofs must have had a thousand doubts, right? And this is why ulama say that we should have the iman of an old lady because it's, it's self-evident truth, right? So we have to understand what belief is. Secondly, we have to understand what doubts are because sometimes we think something is a doubt. It's not even a doubt. Shaitan uses it as an excuse to open this kind of window for himself to start whispering to you thinking, oh my God, I don't have Iman, right? Some doubts are not even doubts. We have to differentiate between intellectual doubts, social doubts, right? So just fleeting whisperings. There is a fundamental difference and we have to have the right tools from the Quran and Sunnah for us to understand the difference between doubts, fleeting doubts, whisperings and other types of doubts. Also, we're going to discuss the causes of these doubts and give some answers insha'Allah, okay? So, what is Iman? Well, I don't want to get into a huge kind of theological discussion on the issue, right? But let's focus first linguistically. Iman comes from the root word to feel, feel secure, okay? So it's a belief that you have conviction in. Now this conviction doesn't just mean intellectual, right? It's a spiritual type of conviction because you could be convinced but not be able to articulate your reasons why you're convinced. Let me repeat. You could be convinced about something, but you may not be able to articulate why you are convinced. Let me give an example. Who believes their mother gave birth to them? Everybody, right? My mother gave birth to me. Right. Intellectually prove it. Everyone's silent all of a sudden. You can't prove your mother gave birth to you. Something to think about. Some people say, oh, I have a birth certificate. Well, that could be made up, right? That's just testimonial evidence, which is valid evidence, but it could be made up, right? I could say Obama is my father. I could give you a birth certificate. I could sign it, right? You may say, oh, I could do a DNA test. But you don't have a DNA test at home. You don't have a home DNA test kit. You don't have a DNA certificate that says 99% she's your mother. Your father told you. You have to believe him. Your mother told you. You have to believe her. The point I'm trying to say here is the kind of evidence that you have that your mother is your mother can be challenged. It doesn't mean though that your mother never gave birth to you because you know, right? It's one of those things like you know the real world is real. Right? We're not going to start talking about is this table real? Does it really exist outside of my mind? Yes, there are Western philosophical debates on realism and idealism. Is everything just in the brain if, or do things really exist outside? But forget that, we don't have that problem in our tradition, yeah? So I'm only giving you this example to show that you could be convinced about something but you may find difficulty in articulating it. Because I want you to realize there is a difference between Knowing how to prove something to be true and knowing something is true. 
I repeat, there is a difference from knowing something is true and being able to convey that it's true. I don't want you to think it's the same thing. Just because you can't defend Islam, you can't rationalize or reason why Islam is the truth for you, it doesn't mean it's not true. It just means you may have difficulty in conveying it, difficulty in articulating it. It doesn't mean that it's not true for you. There are two different things, just like I know my mom gave birth to me. I know it, just like I know this table's real. Just like I know my name is Hamza. Just like I know the world is round, I know my mom gave birth to me. Can I articulate it intellectually? Maybe I might have some difficulty. I know because I know. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think this is only an Islamic thing. Even the Western tradition has things called self-evident truths. They call them innate truths. For example, I just finished my postgrad in philosophy and I studied one specialist module called the philosophy of psychology. And they had this idea that language is innate. It's called linguistic nativism. And it's based on the argument from the poverty of stimulus. And I don't want to bore you to death, but what it basically means is that a child learner learning and acquiring language, developing language acquisition, right? has limited linguistic input, but what they express is far more complex than the input. So it's, the data is limited, it's poor, it's impoverished, it's called the primary linguistic data. It's limited and poor, and it's, it's poor in quality. It goes through the brain, and what comes out is far more complex, right? For example, a child will have limited sentences, and it will develop grammatical rules based on limited sentences for sentences that the child has never heard before. What many linguists say and philosophers say that there is innate, there are natural domain specific structures in the brain that have linguistic knowledge, like grammar. And that's why you have the famous Noam Chomsky who has discussed this and he is a, one of the main proponents for linguistic nativism. Yes, there are debates amongst them, but the most primary theory at the moment is that language is innate, it's inbuilt. So it's, a, it's innate, right? So they have this concept too that things are innate. So don't think, oh, we're just making this up just to justify the Islamic tradition. No, this is based on normal stuff. Even the world being physical, like this iPad being external to my brain, this is a self-evident truth in Western philosophy. Because they had a huge problem about the physical world. <laughs> like, is it real? <laughs> right? Realism versus idealism. Is this, is this iPad really outside of my brain? Of course it is, Hamza. I can see it. Yeah, but maybe you seeing it could just be in your brain. Right? Maybe our brain is on Mars and there's an alien with metal probes in our brain making us think and feel what we're thinking and feeling right now. So they had a huge debate. So some of them said, it's self-evidently true. What about the fact that you could trust your mind? Now the reason I'm mentioning this, brothers and sisters, is to show that the Western and Eastern tradition has adopted this concept of self-evident truths, right? That things are self-evidently true, you don't have to prove them, we know, right? For example, trusting your mind. The whole of science, read this up for yourself, okay? Read the works of Professor Thomas Nagel, Mind and Cosmos, other people and philosophers that one of the main assumptions or the main self-evident truths for science is that you have to trust your mind. Because if you don't trust your mind that it can eventually formulate truths, then you can't trust science. Because the minute you do science, it assumes that you have a mind that can eventually acquire truth. It's an assumption. You have to start with the fact that you could trust your mind, and then you end up doing science. Now you can't say, well, science can prove you could trust your mind because that would be a circular argument. You're arguing in a circle because you first have to admit that you trust your mind before you do any science. This is called a self-evident truth. They have to accept it. They just have to accept it. Now, the reason I'm mentioning these things is to show that there is things that are self-evidently true and you know they're true, but maybe you can't articulate that they're true. And the idea of things being self-evidently true is a universal phenomenon from science to religion to philosophy. Everyone accepts that there are things called self-evident truths or innate truths. And this links to the idea of the fitrah, 
or we'll discuss this a little bit later. So, my point here is that we believe we have Iman, which means basically from the root word for something that is secure. We have secure belief in the fundamentals of Islam. So what are the fundamentals of Islam concerning Iman? To believe in Allah. We believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe in His names and attributes. We believe He, he is transcendent. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique. We believe He's uniquely one. We believe that He deserves to be worshipped. He's the only deity worthy of worship. Right? These are fundamental truths for us. We believe in Allah. We believe in the prophets and the messengers. And we believe in the finality of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We believe in the angels. We believe in Allah's angels. In the revealed books, the Quran, the Torah, the Injil. We believe in the day of judgment. Every single one of us is going to be accounted, taken to account by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we believe in divine decree and predestination. Now let's summarize what divine decree and predestination is. Allah knows everything. He knows what has happened and what will happen. God has recorded all that has happened and all that will happen. Whatever Allah wills to happen happens and whatever He wills not to happen does not happen. And Allah is the creator of everything. This is, is, is the summary of believing in the divine decree and predestination of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the basis for these beliefs? So these are the six pillars of Iman. What's the basis for these beliefs? Very simple. The Quran and the Sunnah. Essentially, it's the Quran and the Sunnah. And also a basis for this belief is also the Fitrah. Now, not all the beliefs, but some fundamental aspects of these beliefs. The basis, okay? And we'll discuss what the fitrah means in the Islamic tradition in a, in a little bit. So, the Quran, the Sunnah, and the fitrah really form the kind of spiritual and intellectual foundations for our faith. Okay? You with me so far? Okay, good. So, let's now go into the topic of certainty in Islam. Because before you start discussing doubts, let's discuss what is certainty in the Islamic tradition. Because some of us, we think... The only way to be certain if you see something, right? But this is wrong. This is absolutely wrong. This is not the Islamic concept of certainty. Oh, I have to see it, bro, to believe it, right? We have this famous kind of line. If I see it, I believe it, right? And we have this wrong approach that sometimes we think that you have to have full knowledge of something to actually believe it to be true. That's not true either. Certainty in Islam has levels. Okay, there are levels of certainty in the Islamic tradition And we have this from the Quran itself For example, the three levels are as follows The first level is called Ilmul Yaqeen The Yaqeen of knowledge Which basically means that you know something to be true based upon its concepts Right? Like one plus one is equal to two You know this, this is a knowledge based truth One plus one is equal to two you have another concept of certainty, which is based on what? Ainul Yaqeen. The certainty of seeing something, of experiencing something. For example, I know there are more than three people in this room, right? Certain. Based on? Based on what I've just seen. And you could argue it's based on knowledge as well because you're counting, right? But the point here, an aspect of this certainty is based on what I've just seen, right? I know that planes exist, I know that trees exist, based upon what I've seen. This is certainty of the eye. Then you have another type of certainty which is haq al yaqeen which is the certainty of it being true within itself. Like for example, I would even argue the very fact that Allah deserves worship is haq al yaqeen He is the self-evident reality, right? That everything depends upon. If everything is dependent, then they must be dependent on something that's independent. This for me is not just based on knowledge, it's not based on seeing something, it's based on it being true by the very fact that it's true. Right? It's necessary, necessarily true. For example, 
if you, were op if you were to open your fridge and on top of the egg box you found an iPhone, you're not going to open the fridge, look at the iPhone on top of the egg box, close the fridge and say, it had to be there. No, you're going to question, why is it there? There's nothing necessary about its existence because it could have not been there, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is necessary for everything else to exist, right? And that's what we mean by something being haq al yaqeen is true, but the very fact of it being in existence. Its very truth is self evident, is necessary. Because if it wasn't necessary, then we couldn't exist. Because we're all dependent, and therefore all of these dependent things had to be dependent on something independent, right? And this has been discussed in the books of Aqidah. For example, Aqidah Tahawiyah, if you look at some of the commentaries, they go deep into this argument. I don't want to get into the argument, but I just want to give you the concept that there is an idea of something being true by virtue of its own existence, right? So these are the three levels of certainty. So don't think that you have to know everything about everything to be certain. That's wrong. Don't think you have to have seen everything in order for you to be certain. That's also wrong. So you have to understand there are ranges of certainty concerning the, con it's con the concept in Islam. Now there is a really interesting example. There is a ikhtilaf on the understanding of this ayah, but I'm just bringing this point across. I'm going to talk about what Razi said about this ayah. But if you know the famous, the famous ayah concerning Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he said, my Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. Allah said, have you not believed? He said, yes, but I ask only that my heart may be satisfied. Allah said, take four birds and commit them to yourself. Then after slaughtering them, put on each hill a portion of them, then call them, they will come flying to you in haste. And know that Allah is exalted in might and wise. Now, Razi, he mentions something very interesting here. He basically says that this means that there were degrees of certainty. And Ibrahim alayhi salam wasn't doubtful about Allah's power. He didn't doubt the existence of Allah. He didn't doubt the power of Allah. But rather, he wanted to reach the higher level of certainty, right? Ilm al yaqeen, ayn al yaqeen, haq al yaqeen, right? So, this is one opinion of, of, of Razi that basically it's got nothing to do with the fact that he doubted. He's a messenger, he won't doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But rather, his heart to be satisfied, so he, he increases what you call maybe spiritual certainty based on what we've just discussed earlier. Now, so now we know there are levels of certainty in Islam and you don't have to know everything in order to be certain. You don't have to see everything in order for you to be certain, okay? So, how do we have a basic level of certainty in Islam? Now, you have to understand something very important. The Islamic tradition doesn't start with doubt. I repeat, Islam does not start with doubt. It starts with truth. The Western tradition starts with doubt. And one of the major reasons why the Western tradition starts with doubt, if you read the works of Descartes and others, is because they had the problem of the Catholic Church as an authority. It was their testimony, their command, their decree, what they said had to be true. And obviously if you study European history, there was chaos and war, the 80 year wars, the 30 year wars, the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day, it was, it was mad, right? There was religious wars. Religiously inspired wars. That's why you had the 16th century Protestant Reformation. And you, as a result of that, you had the philosophers that basically wanted to challenge the authority of the church, essentially, or challenge the kind of, you know, belief that the church is always right. It's self-evidently right. So they wanted to start with, well, how do we now formulate knowledge? So they said, well, you start with doubt. And hence you had the famous Cartesian doubt I think, therefore I am. But before that, he basically had lots of doubts, you know, maybe even God is tricking me. But then he changed it and said, no, 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 it's like, it, maybe it's the devil. Uh, but he, he first started with God, but he realized what age he was living in. And if he carried on with that narrative, he probably was hanged. He could have been hanged. So he said, maybe a demon is, could be tricking me that these truths are true, right? So he was basically started with a form of skepticism. And then he basically said, how do I anchor all knowledge? And he anchored it to himself. The very fact that he thinks, that therefore he is. I think, therefore I am. So the, the Western tradition, generally speaking, is entrenched in skepticism. 
But the Islamic tradition, although we have a healthy type of skepticism, but it's not a skepticism based on the fundamentals, right? We don't have skepticism based on the fundamentals. We have skepticism maybe based on fiqh, on jurisprudence. There's a healthy discussion on jurisprudence, right? There's a healthy discussion on these issues. But when it comes to the fundamentals, we don't start with doubt. We start with truth. Now, why? Let me explain. In the Islamic tradition, we have the concept of the fitrah, right? Fatara, which you have words like fatrun and fatarahu, meaning Allah has created something within us that is a capacity that can facilitate truth, the acknowledgement of truth. What are these basic truths? That Allah exists and He deserves worship. And other ulama said it's basic moral truths, like general good and general bad, okay? So three main aspects that the fitrah facilitates. It facilitates coming to the truth that Allah exists, He deserves to be worshipped, and basic good and evil, according to the mainstream ulama from Al-Ghazali, and specifically Ibn Taymiyyah because he discusses more than anybody else, okay? So we have this concept of fitrah. Now the fitrah is not knowledge, alright? Because Allah says in the Quran that He created you from your mother's wombs knowing nothing. So it's not knowledge, but rather it's like a capacity. If you, if you study electronics, there's a thing called a capacitor. What does a capacitor do? It takes in energy, right? If I remember my old school physics, right? That's what a capacitor does, right? It stores? What does it store? Electricity, right? So the fitrah is like a capacitor. It takes in your experiences, the Quran and Sunnah, your life, whatever the case may be, and it stores it and facilitates it, right? So it's not knowledge in and of itself, but it's like a, a capacity, a facilitator. So the fitrah has a very interesting role in acquiring truth. So we understand we have a fitrah, we have an innate nature, that facilitates knowing Allah exists, knowing that He deserves worship, and basic good and evil. And in the Islamic tradition, the Quran, the Sunnah, even experiences in our life, even reasoning, rationality, Allah mentions this so many times in the Quran, they serve as almost triggers to awaken the fitrah. Because we have the famous hadith in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet wasallam, he said every child is born in a state of fitrah. Right? But it's his, it's, his, it's his parents who basically change their ways. They become a Christian, a Jew, a Magian or whatever, right? So it's the society or the social effects that deviate the fitrah. They veil the fitrah. And therefore it can't find the true path. But what the Quran does, revelation, sunnah, experiences in your life, even sound reasoning, because the early pious predecessors, they didn't differentiate between revelation and sound reason. There's a difference between wrong reasoning and sound reasoning. If you really use your mind properly, without any baggage, you could basically acquire certain fundamental truths. So if you have sound reasoning, so experience, sound reasoning, revelation, Quran and Sunnah, they serve as triggers to awaken the fitrah or unveil the fitrah. And that therefore allows you to formulate that truth. And that truth is self-evident, why? Because if you go back to the Qur'an, Allah, what does He say to us? He said to the progeny of Adam alayhi salam, who is your Lord? How did we reply? Exactly, we said, indeed you are our Lord. So there's a there is ikhtilaf on this issue in a deep way, but generally speaking, we have the self-evident truth that Allah is our Lord. The fitrah facilitates that. It could be veiled based on wrong knowledge, based on wrong experiences, based on having parents who are not Muslim in a society that veils the fitrah. The Quran and Sunnah and reason and revelation and experiences unveil the fitrah so the truth of Tawheed could shine through. Does this make sense? Now the reason I've taken a long time to discuss this is because it shows that we don't start with doubt. We already know who our Lord is. The fitrah facilitates that. And if we don't have a veiled fitrah, then we'll come to that truth. If it's veiled, then when we engage with the Quran and the Sunnah, and we engage with experiences and with sound reason, it unveils our fitrah. Make sense? So far? Good. So it means that we, we don't start with doubt. We start with there is a truth. 
And this is why the ayat in the Quran, we have to understand them properly. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, right? We, we, sometimes we, we, we belittle the Quran in an, accidentally. When we see an ayah in the Quran that talks about, for example, the camels and how we created it, or when the, Allah says that you are an alaqa, you are a nutfatin min maniyin, or when Allah talks about natural phenomena, what do we do straight away? We say, ah, scientific miracle. This is rubbish. Sorry. This is wrong. Because what we've done, we've made science into a god now. We've deified science and we've limited the Quran. Science changes. I've just spent a whole year studying the philosophy of science on a postgrad level and I'm telling you, there's no certainty in science. Study it. Just, just Google. Go type in scientific realism. Do it. Just type it in. There's a, an anti-realism. Instrumentalism. There's a big discussion on can scientific theories represent the state of affairs? Are they representations of the truth? Or are they just good models? Or are they just useful? It's a big discussion. And all of them agree now that even if you think science gives you absolute truth, it can always change. They are always defeasible. I will bring out my notes, my postgrad notes for you to see now. Because you have some online idiots, no offense, don't want to swear, but you have online idiot, idiots from you know, the skeptic tradition and the, the aggressive atheists. They think, oh, you know, science is like wahi, it's like revelation. It's not, it changes. Even if it's a workable theory, right? Even if it's well tested, it changes. If you study the history of science, you see that even workable theories changed. Look at the famous theory of phlogiston. In the 1700s, they had this theory called phlogiston. What phlogiston was is that things that could burn, that were combustible, they had something called phlogisticate, phlogiston, and when you burnt it, it released phlogisticated air. It was a theory. It was working in the 1700s. It was working so well that Dan Rutherford in 1772 or 1773, he used this workable theory and he discovered nitrogen. But after a few years later, they rejected phlogiston because it didn't, they realized it wasn't working anymore. It was falsified. So this shows to us that you can get a truth from a false theory. <laughs> That's the whole point. And things that work could be false because it was working, but then it ended up being false. So you just have to understand when you study the philosophy of science and you study the history of science, you know that these are not absolutes. There's no absolutes. Even when you study induction, which is the method in how they basically formulate scientific conclusions, you see that induction doesn't lead to certainty. Read David Hume. And that's why these people don't even read their own Western philosophy. You know, David Hume, the famous argument that you're always going to have limited observations. How can you conclude for the general? Because you may have another observation that contradicts previous conclusions. Right? And we've seen this with cosmology. They believe in the steady state theory. Now they believe in the Big Bang. Now they don't know what they're believing. There are 17 different models to explain the same data. The data is underdetermined, meaning that the data can give you seven, that 17 different models explain the same data. There's no huck. I know you hear on YouTube some brothers saying Big Bang is truth. No, it's not. There's 17 different models. This is popular science. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is to show you. Actually, I'm just get my notes back. I do apologize. So the reason I'm mentioning this, brothers, is basically to show you that we don't start with doubt. And also that when you look into the Quran, don't think that the Quran is just talking about a natural phenomena in a scientific way. These ayat, when they talk about natural phenomena, are there to awaken your fitrah. They move from a truth to a truth. They don't move from a known to an unknown. Let me repeat. Science moves from a known to an unknown. You have limited data, and then you move for an unknown, for the general data, right? Just like in Darwinian evolution at the moment, Darwinism, right? By natural selection, evolution by natural selection, they have limited data and they conclude for the general. All theories work like that. There is no theory that basically has all the possible observations at their disposal to analyze. They don't, right? So they have limited data and they conclude for the general. So they move from a known to an unknown because they're generalizing. That's the nature of theories. And yes, they're workable and they've been tested, fair enough. But the point is, they never move from a known to a known. It's a known to an unknown. From limited data to the general. From a known to an unknown. From a limited 
to the general, okay? That's, that's, how, that's how it moves. But in Islam, it doesn't have that element of doubt when it comes to these fundamentals because it moves from a known, look at the camel and how it's created, to awaken the fitrah, which facilitates our self-evident truth that we know our Lord is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we basically said to Allah that you are our Lord. So it moves from a known to a known. So the role of ayat when they're talking about natural phenomena, when they're talking about man, life and the universe, is there to awaken whatever, what you already know. It doesn't move from a known to an unknown. It moves from a known, look at the camel, look at the trees, look at the sun, look at the moon, to awaken the self-evident truth that Allah deserves to be worshipped. Let me give an example with my favourite toy when I was five years old. My favourite toy when I was five years old was Donald Duck. Everyone know Donald Duck? Yeah, I'm trying to do Donald Duck voice, it's not working, but that was Donald Duck. I had a plastic Donald Duck and his beak was like a bit chewed off. I think I used to chew it out of frustration sometimes, right? Now, say for example, fast forward 30 years, I'm 35 years old. Fast forward 30 years and I go to my mom's basement. She doesn't have a basement, just being hypothetical. And I'm helping her clear up. And I'm cleaning up all the bags and all of a sudden, what do I find? All dusty with cobwebs. I find Donald Duck. And I forgot all about my favorite toy. What happens to me? Oh yeah, my toy. I remember I used to play with Donald Duck. Do you see what's happened here? It's a known to a known. When I was five years old, I remember playing with Donald Duck, but I forgot all about it. But then when I experienced Donald Duck, when I found him in my mom's basement, I'm like, oh yeah, it's awakened the truth within. Ayat in the Qur'an have this purpose. They awaken the fitrah, to awaken the truth that Allah is one and He deserves worship. It doesn't move from a known to an unknown, it moves from a known to a known. And that's why we don't start with doubt. This is so important for you to realize, Wallahi, it will change the way you look at the Qur'an. By the way, I'm not making this up. Just read Usul al-Tafsir, read the classical works. And that's how they saw the ayat when they're talking about natural phenomena. It was there to awaken the reality that Allah deserves worship. From rububiyyah to uluhiyyah. Allah's rububiyyah that He's the creator, He's the sole creator and sustainer of the universe, to the fact that He deserves to be worshipped. That was the reality of the ayat, to move from rububiyyah to uluhiyyah. It's not to start from shak, start from doubt, from something vanni, to basically conclude something vanni. No, Allah is not vanni. No way. It's to, move, it's to move from a truth to a truth. The fact that you see and observe these things in the universe, there is a creative wisdom and power in the universe, and that awakens the reality within you via the fitrah, to awaken the self-evident truth that we know Allah is our Lord and deserves worship. Does this make sense? So therefore, our epistemology is totally different. Epistemology means the study of knowledge. It's totally different. We don't start with the doubt. And this is why even when you give doubt to non-Muslims, you have to appreciate this that they already know. That the role of, a, of the da'i, the role of the du'at, is to act like a farmer, is to water the seed that already exists. Because they have that seed. Because they said to Allah, you are our Lord. So what is, how do you water the seed? with good akhlaq, with love, with compassion. You water the seed with Qur'an, Sunnah, giving them good experiences, good reasoning. These are all things that water that seed for our human beings, our brothers and sisters in humanity. Does that make sense? It's a really profound way of looking at the Qur'an and a profound way of looking at the kind of knowledge in Islam. Okay? This is so important. Hopefully it'll give you an idea that you know, you take a chill pill now, you don't have to start from doubt because you already know, right? Because really, if you really think about it, if you always started from doubt, then you'd be doubting all the time. There'll be no truth, really. So even the skeptics have to start with the truth. Do you know this? Someone who's a skeptic, who denies truth, who's skeptical, skeptical about truth, even fundamental truths, they're not really skeptics. They have to believe in some truth, because they believe that there is no truth. And that's the truth for them, <laughs> right? Because if someone says to you, there is no such thing as truth, say, okay then, you know what you just said? 
Is that true? <laughs> that's how you beat a skeptic, basically. I know that's a very crude way of dealing with a skeptic, but essentially it reduces it to that point. You say, oh, you don't know, how do you know? Uh, there can't be any truth. Okay. Is it true that there can't be any truth? Yeah. Well, you believe in the truth then. So you have to start with the fundamental. But that's what I'm trying to say. So really, skepticism doesn't really count for much because it has to start with the truth. But yet, its whole philosophy is to deny truth. But they have to start with it. Make sense? Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. So we've gone through quite a few complex topics, but I wanted to really ingrain it within you, this concept of the fitrah, because it's absolutely important. So, what are doubts? Now, we have to understand that Islam understands that people can doubt. Even Surah Baqarah, what does Allah say? وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا If you're in doubt about this book, we have sent down to our servant. If you're in doubt, then bring one chapter like it. Allah says in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, there is no doubt in this book, right? A guidance for those who are pious. So this concept of dhanni, of shak, of doubt, exists in the Qur'an and Sunnah. And it, therefore the Qur'an and Sunnah address these issues. Now, you have to understand that doubts are part of life and just because you have a question, it doesn't mean you doubt. For example, if you're confused on how you can reconcile Allah's wisdom with Allah's creative power, if you don't know how to reconcile that, you don't know, you have a question, it doesn't mean you doubt Islam. You still believe He's one, you still believe He deserves worship, you just have a question. These questions are fine, the ulama discuss these type of questions. Don't think questions on the branches of faith, questions on even fiqh, questions even on ethics and morality, these, it doesn't mean that you don't have iman, you don't have yaqeen, you don't have certainty. Don't fall for that trap. Don't allow shaitan to use your own voice against you. I have questions. I had a problem. It was called the problem of evil. Why is there so much evil in the world? Didn't know how to answer it properly. I went to the Christian books. We spoke to some ulama. Then I went to the chapter 18 of the Quran, right? Looked at the narrative between Musa alayhi salam and Khidr. Gave you my answer. It was sufficient for me. Absolutely, right? Another speaker, he had the same issue, but he went to Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 30, when Allah announces to the angels he's going to send a vicegerent on earth, and that whole narrative was sufficient for him. We get answers from different places. People have questions, it's not a problem. Right? So don't think questions mean you don't have yaqeen. Because certainty means that you believe in Allah and He deserves worship. Now just because you, you doubt how Allah could do this, or sometimes you doubt the reconciliation between him being Al-Hakim and Al-Khaliq, or you have an issue concerning, you know, how do you explain the hudud, right? Or how do you explain certain ethical issues in Islam, I'm in doubt about this, right? What about gender issues in Islam, I don't really know how to explain, I have some doubts. That's not a problem, don't think there's something wrong with you. These are healthy. These exist in our, in our books, in the ulama. Just because it's a question about your, your faith from an ethical point of view or from the branches of faith point of view, it doesn't mean the foundations, you, you, you basically don't have certainty in the foundations. Don't allow shaitan to play tricks with you. Just be humble and know that you can get the answer from the scholars or people that know. Okay? So doubts are part of the Islamic tradition, there's nothing to be worried about. And what's interesting, the Qur'an encourages thinking, right? The Qur'an is full of thinking. Do they not ponder upon the Qur'an? Do they not ponder upon the Qur'an or the locks on their hearts? Right? In themselves do they not reflect. Do they not see? Continues. The alternation of the night and day. Makes you think, reflect, ponder. So there are a few doubts we need to consider. Number one, intellectual doubts. Number two, social doubts. Number three, spiritual doubts. Number four, moral doubts. Number five, egocentric doubts. And number six, whisperings. Whisperings from shaitan. So let's address all of these and give you the concepts how to deal with each doubt. Yeah? Should we do that? You ready? Good. So the first type of doubt is what I call the intellectual type of doubt, okay? Now usually this comes from the scientific community, right? Or people who like science, because we live in an age of scientific rationalism. By the way, Islam loves science. 
According to Western historians, Ibn al-Haytham, the first scientist, was a Muslim. His name was Ibn al-Haytham. If you read the biographical works of Ibn al-Haytham, he had a big beard, mashallah, tabarakallah, and he prayed, and he was a pious man. And he said, I only do the science because I want to find out the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the creative world. So, you know, with nothing to be ashamed of. But science has become like almost this social phenomenon now. That it's like, it's become a yardstick for everything. You know, it could get you married, pay your taxes, brush your teeth, <laughs> right? It's become like the religion of the white coats from a social perspective because it works, right? Now obviously the scientific academic community, they know just because something works, it doesn't mean it's true. And they know that science doesn't lead to certainty. They know this because it's ever changing and shifting. It's the shifting sands of science. For example, read any book on the philosophy of science by Hugh Goetsch, for example, right? Hugh Goetsch, or even Alex Rosenberg, or Stathis Psilos, all the philosophers, yeah, Elliot Sober, these are all mainstream philosophers of science that you read on a postgrad and undergrad level, and they say, there's no certainty here, if you want certainty, go somewhere else, it's not in a science. Science is great, it works, it's beautiful, we love it, right? That's the nature of science, it's a useful tool. But what happens these days is, just because we hear sometimes a scientific conclusion, we go crazy. The amount of emails I get from Muslims, oh brother, they found the God particle, my Iman is low. And I'm like, oh my God, what is this guy talking about? You know, there's a, there's a popular magazine, yeah? God particle found, right? It's called the Higgs boson, right? And therefore, it shattered his Iman. He wasn't bothered to read the scientific paper. He read it in a newspaper or in a popular magazine. He has no idea what the Higgs boson is. Just because someone said, you know, a scientist said they found the God particle, therefore his Iman is low. This is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And it shows that we've, we've suspended our level of thinking. Do you know what the Higgs boson was? The Higgs boson was a particle, right, that they found, that made up the Higgs field. The Higgs field was switched on in the early universe to give particles mass apart from the photon. That's what it was. Someone, right, according to them, switched on the Higgs field, and it gave particles mass, apart from the photon. And what they found was, the particle that made up the Higgs field. That's it. Doesn't deny God, doesn't affirm, got nothing to do with theology or creation, right? Nothing. And the reason they call it the God particle is because, historically, it was so hard to find, they called it the goddamn particle. And because they were lazy, then they called it the God particle. <laughs> and that's the point. It had nothing to do with, with, with theology. So, the reason I'm mentioning this, I know it's a crude example, but it's to show that science will never ever deny Allah. Ever. It can't. If you study the philosophy of science, it has no job. Because science, according to Eliot Sober, Professor Eliot Sober, restricts its attention to that which observations can solve. By the very definition of Allah, He's a metaphysical concept. Right? Meaning, He's not empirical. Laysa kemithli shay. Allah is inside or outside the universe? Outside of the universe. If I make the table, I don't become the table, right? If I, I'm a carpenter, I make the table, do I become the table? I am distinct and disjoined from the table. As Ibn Taymiyyah said, that creation is distinct and disjoined from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Laysa kemithli shay. Al-Ghazali said the same thing, all of our ulama said the same thing, the mainstream ulama. So, science can never affirm directly or deny directly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because it can only address that which observations can solve. For it now to start discussing the existence of Allah, it's outside of its methodology. It's like having two rooms. I know what's in this room, but I don't know what's in the next room. And just because I see a carpet in this room, I cannot conclude logically, therefore, there is no carpet in the other room. So if you claim to be a scientist and you claim to deny God based on science, it's equivalent of having two rooms, you don't know what's in the other room, you're in one room, and just because you can see a carpet in this room, you now conclude there's, there's no carpet in the next room. This is a logical fallacy, there is no logical leap, it doesn't follow. It's non sequitur, meaning it doesn't logically follow. And this is why I think it was Hugh Goat, he says, to basically suggest that science supports atheism, you get high marks for enthusiasm, low marks for logic, right? 
any, any sincere academic science scientist, go, go to Qatar Foundation, go to Education City, go to Oxford, go to Cambridge, ask a sincere scientist and a philosophy of science, a philosopher of science, and ask them, can science ever directly deny God? No. It can't. Because it's a metaphysical concept. Nothing which you observe can deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what science can do is a few things. Number one, stay silent on the topic. Or number two, maybe suggest evidence that you can use to infer that there is a de there's a designer. But it can't directly deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone who knows their science, anyone who knows the philosophy of science can never deny God no matter what they say. You had some guy, I think he's in Victor Stenger, I think that's his name. He wrote a book, God the Failed Hypothesis, how science disproves God or something. It's a ridiculous book. Science can never deny God. All it can do is maybe suggest alternative models to explain how creation developed. But that's a different story, right? That's denying a creation story, that's denying how species were evolved or they're affirming a different kind of narrative or different theory for how species evolved. That's a different discussion. But to outright deny a creator for the universe, this is impossible. Science can't deal with that at all. And when you study, for example, the inductive model or induction, which moves from a limited set of observations and concludes for the general, you see that there's always a potential observation or a future observation or another observation that could deny previous conclusions. So even if science were to say, this is our conclusion, a scientific fact doesn't mean fact with big F, right? It's a small f, italics. Because there's always a possibility of another observation to deny previous conclusions. And we've seen this in the history of science. We even see this now. There was, last year there were challenges by some cosmologists that were saying the universe now didn't have a beginning. They're changing their mind again. Other scientists said, well, actually, maybe the universe is not expanding anymore. These are discussions in academia based on different theoretical models, different pieces of evidence that they find, right? This is the, nat the beauty of science. It's supposed to change. So even if they were to make such a conclusion, it's not a certain fact because there's a possibility it can change. So that's the intellectual doubts. So science can never really doubt the foundations of Islam, which is that Allah exists and that he deserves to be worshipped. These are spiritual, rational truths. They're not based on the touch and feel. And things that you touch and feel are there to awaken the fact that there is a wisdom behind the universe. Because, you know, the interesting thing is, even if the science changes, it always assumes there is power and wisdom behind it. Right? Because for science to work, you have to trust your mind and you have to believe that, this, that the universe can be rationalized. That the universe can be conceived. Like Einstein said, what's inconceivable out of the universe is that the universe can be conceived. Is that you can understand the universe. Right? So you have to always assume that there is some form of wisdom behind the universe or, and some form of creative power. They could never deny this. So even if you change your scientific theory, the fundamentals always remain. There is a wisdom and a power in the universe which awakens the fitrah to bring about the truth that Allah deserves to be worshipped. Make sense? So bring on the science, bring us any theory, even if they contradict, they're always going to assume a power and a wisdom, always. Bring any theory. There are 17 different models for the Big Bang, Ahlan wa Sahlan, bring them on. They're going to assume there's a power and they're going to assume there's some kind of wisdom. Khalas, no matter what theory you have. And that's what the Quran wants to get to, the fundamental, the basis, the fundamental intellectual driving force that there is a creative power and wisdom behind the universe and therefore it awakens your fitrah and brings about the self-evident truth that Allah deserves to be worshipped. So we've done this intellectual doubts, the social doubts. Ikhwan and Akhawat were social animals, right? So many studies have been done. Read this study about Philip Zimbardo, it's called the famous prison study. That he did an experiment over a few weeks that he got some participants, half of them became the prisoners, half of them became the the guards, the prison guards. And after a few days or a week, they started to believe they were real prisoners. And they started to act as prisoners and the guards started to act as guards to the point where the prisoners, they wanted to be released and they asked for their lawyer. But they didn't do anything wrong, it was an act. But they were so immersed in that social bubble that they started to believe these things to be true. And this has been replicated by the way. It's the famous Philip Zimbardo study. Look it up. 
Another famous study is the Milgram study. He did a fascinating study on obedience. And he put an actor in this kind of glass thing and he connected fake electrodes to, to him with an electric meter. And he went up to fatal, low shock, medium shock, fatal shock. And he had participants from different demographics, different demographic backgrounds in America. And you had a white scientist, white coat scientist saying, ask him questions. If he gets it wrong, just increase the voltage. And he was an actor, so, but he acted it really well. They didn't know he was an actor. Over 60% went to the fatal voltage just because it was an experiment, it was formal, they had a scientist there. This is social. We are social animals. We get affected by society, whether we like it or not. Even social norms are developed because of our need to be certain and our need to belong. It's called informational social influ influence and normative social influence. We, need, we, we want to be certain about it. If we're uncertain about something, we go to the group, the masses. We want to belong. Even if we're certain about something, just because we belong, we may suspend our beliefs. We're social animals. So, brothers, a lot of our doubts sometimes come because of the wrong social circles we have. It's a fact. Whether we like it or not, we are social animals. These are sociological almost, well, facts, right? That tell us that we get affected by our social circles. We know this in the Quran and Sunnah, but we also know this in the amazing symbol called the dog. Wallah. The dog is one of the most amazing animals that you could... If someone called me a dog, I would take it as a compliment. Wallah, I'm not joking. Study the dog. Allah mentions the dog. Yes or no? Why? For no reason? Allah doesn't mention anything for no reason. Why does he mention the dog? Ibn Kithir questions this, by the way. Why did Allah mention the dog? In the people of the cave. If the dog's out the story, who cares? Does it change the story? But then Ibn Kathir answers. Do you know what he says? The dog happened to be with the pious people who were to run away from shirk. And not only did Allah save the people, He also saved the animal companion, the dog. To show to us, if Allah could save an animal, a lowly dog, just because He was with pious people, imagine what He could do to you. Amazing, huh? So that's why social circles are so important. To be attached with people who are more pious than you, people, the ulama, the students of knowledge. Because maybe the barakah from that, Allah would have saved you too, just like He saved the lowly dog. So realize that a lot of our doubts can be social. I've seen this in my life. I have an interfaith family. My parents are non-Muslim. May Allah guide them, right? You know, I have non-Muslim cousins and relatives and friends. And sometimes when you're immersed in that environment, you know, sometimes you're thinking, I'm thinking things I never used to think before. Why? Because your social circles have changed. And then sometimes you have to draw back a bit, you know, collect yourself spiritually, intellectually, and go back again. Do you see? This is important. Very important for us to understand. We are social animals. So a lot of our doubts are not genuine. They're just based on social aspects. And that's why many of today's modernists, right, who want to change lots of Quran and Hadith, this Hadith, they say, doesn't make sense anymore. This ayah, it's maqasid sharia, throw that in the bin. You know, all of this kind of crazy neo-modernist stuff. By the way, there's a difference between progressive and modernist. I think we should be progressive, meaning we should do ishtihad based on unprecedented phenomena. This is part of our classical tradition. If there are new realities, we go to the Quran and Sunnah, do ishtihad. I can't do it, obviously. <laughs> Leave it to the ulama. But we should be progressive in that way. If there's new realities, we need to deal with them based on Quran and Sunnah. So the difference between progressive and being a modernist. A modernist is, oh, you know, the Quran and Sunnah don't work anymore. That's what they say. And that's the problem. So the issue with the modernist is they're just, they're just a reaction of society. Because I like to ask them. I don't even go into arguments. I say, 200 years ago, would you be saying this? And they won't. They're just affected by the society. They're affected by the neoliberal culture. And that's it. Because you wouldn't be saying this 200 years ago. Well, khalas, go to sleep. Right? So a lot of our doubts are social doubts. Spiritual doubts is the third type of doubt. And this is the main type of doubt, brothers and sisters, okay? I would argue, and this is arbitrary, but I would argue 90% of our doubts have spiritual foundations. See it from my own life. I'm giving you my mistakes and experiences. I've been Muslim for 14 years, and I will be dealing with apostates, and some of them will come back to Islam. I'll be dealing with non-Muslims, and they'll come to Islam. And I'll give them an answer that is so convincing, but when I'm giving it, I'm not convinced. 
<laughs> and I'd be thinking to myself, I just gave him a really good answer, but I, I, I'm, I'm feeling something here. What's going on? And for me, I realized it had nothing to do with the intellectual answer. It was to do with what was going on here. I neglected dhikr for months. Neglected dua for months. You neglect your sunnah for months. These are things that protect your heart. These are things that protect your heart, brothers and sisters. The sunnah, the tahajjud, the reading of the Quran are things that protect your heart. If you neglect them, then your protection of your heart is gone. And you have a very thin shield, right? My own experience as someone who deals with this on a daily basis, travels the world and deals with people with doubts and deals with people who are apostates. I've seen this within me, within me that I have doubted, not because my mind was in doubt or I doubted Allah's existence or the fact that He deserved worship, but there was something awful going on here. That's the point. And wallahi, 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 you maintain your dhikr in the morning and the evening, sincerely, as best as you can, your doubts are gone. My own experience, I'm not saying I maintain dhikr all the time, okay? May Allah pr protect me from, from, from nifaq. But I've seen it from my experience who engages on the front line on these ideas. I would speak the haq, but sometimes my heart would be a bit wavering. What's, I'd be thinking, what's going on? And I always realized, you idiot Hamza, you're destroying your own soul. Where is your dhikr in the morning? Where is your going to Fajr in the morning in the masjid? Where is your dhikr in the evening? Where is your dhikr doing it sincerely and properly? Sometimes we abuse dhikr. Read the book from An-Nawawi in Kitab al -Afkar. Read it. We know sometimes after Salah we're like, Subhanallah, 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 Khalas. I call this AK-47 dhikr. <laughs> yeah, it's true. We abuse, there's no meaning, there's no ruhaniyah, there's no, there's no love in it. And now we, he talks about this and he says, do dhikr slowly. When you say subhanallah, feel subhanallah. When you say alhamdulillah, it means alhamdulillah, you're feeling it. You're not thinking alhamdulillah, oh man, what a terrible life. Alhamdulillah, oh I've got no blessings. Alham you know, do you see my point? We say one thing, we're feeling another thing. Try and get your state of being in with those words. Try your best. And do it with ihsan, do it with excellence, do it, with, do it properly. You could do it walking as well, you know, sometimes we have to go back to work, do it on the way. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah, oh, SubhanAllah, you know, glory be to Allah, transcendent is Allah, Alhamdulillah. You know, the other du'as, Raditu bilayhi rabban, wa bi islami deenan, wa bi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nabiyyan. I am content with Allah as my Lord, with Islam as my religion, with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as, as my Prophet, you know. Bismillahi alladhi la yudurru ma asmihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fi samai wa husam al-alim. Right? In the name of Allah, with whose name nothing in the heavens and earth can harm. And believe that's true. All of these du'as about your, your, your conviction, your iman, your protection. I'm telling you, do it. Maintain it and you see changes. And even the brothers around me see those changes. They could say, Hamza, you ain't done dhikr for a week. Right? You could just see it in the face. My wife sees it all the time. But she says it a bit more offensively. She says, shaitan's got you today. <laughs> That's what she says. Shaitan's on your face. And, and we have that code. She knows what, she knows. She's like, you haven't been doing your dhikr. You'll be mucking about. You're being a naughty boy. Come back. And especially if you're living in the West, you're doing dawah, you're involved in this commercialism, you're involved in the globalized culture. Because even the Qatar is the West now. You know, Ahlan wa Sahlan West is here, 2022. Yeah? They're, they're going to be on your doorstep drinking and... Prostitutes are gonna come, whether you like it or not, they're gonna fly in. That's what they do. Fly in prostitutes. They do it. It's business. Right? Right? <laughs> he just told me. Yeah. He did. He told me in the car today. That's what happens. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the point is this is gonna happen. Protect your heart, maintain the dhikr, and, and, and I and I believe if you do this, and I've seen it. You know, here's the proof. I had a question. I answered it, but I wasn't convinced here, but I was convinced there. When I started doing my dhikr again, I was convinced here and I was convinced there. Wallahi, honestly, absolutely. I'm giving you my experiences, I'm putting my heart on the table for you, because I love you. Protect your heart. That's it. 90% of the doubts are spiritual, honestly. Even just reading the Quran, even if you don't know the meaning, you don't understand Arabic, just read it. It's still a shifa for you. It's a shifa, it's a healing. Just read it. Just read it. You know, and I even noticed this. You know, sometimes when I read the Quran, I'm more like, more timely with my Isha. 
right? If I don't read the Quran that day, get a bit lazy, I'll push it a bit more, I've got work to do, you know? And you just see these correlations, spiritual correlations between what you do and what happens to your life. And you just learn from experience. So please, brothers and sisters, wallahi, maintain, protect your heart. You know, most of doubts are based on spiritual issues. Absolutely. Let me give you a story. I went to this apostate's house. I get called quite often, relatively speaking, to speak to people who left the religion. And this guy, he was a so-called intellectual scientist guy, but he developed an online gambling website. He got lots of money from it. So hint, hint, right, why he doesn't like Islam now. Because he's getting his dunya from non-Islamic sources. Anyway, I gave him benefit of the doubt and we start talking. Wallahi, I almost squeezed everything I had in my brain. It's not much, but I gave him every drop. Everything. Yalla, you got it. Answering all the questions. Left, right, up, down. Then at the end, he gets a bit frustrated because we're answering questions, right? And this exposes an emotional, spiritual issue, not an intellectual one. And I've seen this with most apostates, by the way. This is my experience. I'm not trying to belittle them. It's my experience. The ones I've dealt with personally, 95% has been emotional, social issues. And the intellectual stuff were just excuses, right? So he said at the end, he got so frustrated, he said, I don't believe in Islam because the Quran says the world is flat. Which is wrong. But that's what he said. I got a bit angry, got a bit arrogant, which I shouldn't have. I said, yeah, the world is flat. You prove to me the world is round. That's what I said to him. Prove to me the world is round. If this is the only thing that leave, left, you left Islam for, you prove to me the world is round. Obviously, I believe the world is round, but I was playing with him. You prove to me the world is round. He was like, obviously the world is round. It's in the science books. So hold on a second, Mr. Empiricist, Mr. Touch and Feel, Mr. Scientist. You're just believing someone else's say so in a book. Oh, but they did the science. How do you know? They just said so. I don't care if there's a million books that says the same thing. You don't have empirical evidence yourself. Yes, I do. Google images. That's again testimony. Did you take the picture yourself? Right? In space and took a picture of Earth? Someone did it for you. And they're saying that's Earth. I don't care if you got 14 million pictures with 14 million people saying that is exactly earth and I've taken that picture, it's still testimonial evidence. Where's your physical evidence? Oh, the mathematics. Have you done the maths? No. Or the geologists have, but have you done it? No, you have to believe they say so, right? Oh, but if you go in a plane, you go in a straight line, you end up in the same place, it means the world is round. Have you done that before? No. Well, give me your answer. Why do you believe the world is round? He was changing color. Then he starts saying, oh, if you go to the highest mountain, you can see the curvature of the earth. No, you can't. It's a slight curve, if you can see it. And it could be mean. It could mean the earth is a semicircle. Or maybe it's a flower shape. You're making an inference. Where's your evidence? Right? And I, I just showed to him that your only evidence for the world is around is testimonial. Then he said, I got it. He was so excited. He said, he's got the answer. By the way, I'm paraphrasing the whole story. Yeah? I don't remember all of it in detail, so I may be a bit putting spice here and there, so forgive me, I'm just doing my best. Then he got so excited and he said, I got it. The shadows, the night and day. And then I said to him, Indeed, in the alternation of the night and day are signs for people who reflect. The Quran. His mouth was on the floor. And I said to him, SubhanAllah, you pointing the finger, there were three fingers pointing back. And the only answer you could find for your so-called doubt was in the Qur'an itself. Allah, his mouth was on the floor. And this for me was a sign that his issue had nothing to do with intellectual stuff. And I had another Iraqi guy come to the office one day and he brought his brother who had the same similar type of doubts. And what I deliberately did, I made him, I made him use a certain methodology and then I made him use another methodology that was contradictory. So two different methodologies to come to certain truths, but they were contradicting each other. I let him do it deliberately, and then I said to him at the end, brother, let me just tell you something, yeah? The reason you're not Muslim, you've left Islam, is not because of your ideas and your intellectual gymnastics. It's because you're arrogant. And don't get offended, because I see it in me as well. And you have to understand, I've deliberately allowed you to use two conflicting intellectual methodologies that contradict each other, 
One must be right and one must be wrong, they can't both be true, but you both use them just to try and disprove Islam, which shows to me has nothing to do with intellectual gymnastics and emotional thing. You just don't want a Lord in your life. You want you to be your own Lord. That's it. Allah says, have you not seen no one who takes his own desires as his Lord? You know, this, this is a problem. So, I give you this story just to know that a lot of these issues are fundamentally, the basis of them are spiritual and emotional. So about moral doubts, you know, sometimes we get so upset about accusations in the media about Islam and the hudud and Islamic ethics, Islamic morality, this is immoral, this is not liberal, this is not progressive, this is not tolerant, all of these false claims. Now there are a few things here, firstly when we study the Islamic tradition properly, we know that it's very tolerant, pluralistic, it's based on rahmah, it's based on amazing values, right, that intuitively and based on our fitrah we could, we could, we could understand. But at the same time, there are some complex issues that, are, that require deeper knowledge, especially when it comes to issues of fiqh, right? i give an example from a liberal perspective. When women see that unmarried women will get half inheritance than their brother if their father passed away, what do they say? Ah, oh, this is not equality. Because they're so crazy, they think equality is basically treating everybody the same. That's injustice. Treating everybody the same is injustice. Imagine giving a newborn baby a kebab, and an old man, baby milk. <laughs> That's injustice, it's two different realities. Meaning, treating two things that are different, the same, is dhulm. Right? Equality doesn't mean treating people the same. Equality means treating the same people the same. Or the people in the same context the same. And it also means that you may have to treat different people differently. Like, for example, you have Social structures that are different for male and female, right? We don't have the same toilets, right? For example, doesn't mean, oh, we're not treating them equally now. Babies, right? Mothers and fathers, they're different, right? Pregnant women have different needs, right? Than someone who's not pregnant. Whether we like it or not, that's, that's a fact. You know, if you study psychology, there are modules in psychology, especially on undergraduate level, called, called individual differences. There are gender differences, whether you like it or not. These are, these are correlations. This is, this, is, this is from the West, it's not from us. This is, this is it, right? There are differences. How can you treat two different things exactly the same? That's dhulm, that's oppression, right? So when they see that, they're like, oh, you know, you give the unmarried uh, daughter half the inheritance, that's unequal, it's dhulm. That's because they've superimposed a false ideology on the Islamic tradition. But if you study Islam properly and you look at all of its values and you look at the fiqh, the jurisprudence, in line with its values and its social model, you see how profound Islam is. Because inheritance is about responsibility and closeness and relationship. So when it comes to this, the reason the son gets twice the inheritance is because he is responsible after his father take care of his, his sister. So he has to pay for her food Shelter, clothing, makeup, <laughs> honestly, right? All her needs. And her money she spends on nobody but herself. His money he spends on her. Education, food, shelter, clothing. He becomes miskin, right? So it's about social responsibility. So since he has more responsibility to take care of her, she inevitably becomes more richer anyway, even if she gets half. So it's not unequal because based on who's responsible for who, right? And that's the Islamic social model. So you can't say it's unequal now. And the reason they say it's unequal because they don't understand Islam in that depth. And that's what we have a duty to teach them, right? So some, so some moral doubts are based on the fact that we don't have the right knowledge. We didn't know that inheritance is based also on closeness of relationship or responsibility, right? Some, some men, unfortunately, in, in our communities think, oh, it's just because she's a woman. That's wrong, right? That's wrong, because it, I think there's a book out, I think there's over 40 examples in fiqh that I think the woman's testimony is more stronger than the man. It's either testimony or it's either inheritance. Uh, don't quote me, yeah? It's one of those two. These are books of fiqh, right? And we know in books of fiqh that a woman's, in, a woman's testimony on some issues goes over the man. Do you know this, right? This is true, it's a fact, it's in our tradition. Right? So, you know, we have to learn more about our Islam as well, because sometimes we don't know, right? So some of the moral doubts are based on lack of knowledge. 
Another aspect of the moral doubt is based on the lack of understanding of who Allah is. This is so important. Because we think now we become the judge. It's me. If I think it's wrong, then it's wrong. This is, this is ego. Who is Allah? Al-Hakim. Yes? He has the totality of wisdom and knowledge. Allah has the picture. We've got the pixel. Allah has the whole jigsaw puzzle together. We've got one small piece. As Ibn Kathir says, Allah has the totality of knowledge. We have fragmentary pieces. Right? So we have to decide when Allah commands something, it's not arbitrary. It's in line with His nature. He is wise. He is Ar-Rahman. So He has the total knowledge and wisdom. He is the merciful. So therefore, when He commands something, it's wise and merciful. Even if you don't understand it. And this is not a blind obedience because when I was on the plane and the pilot said, Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be experiencing some turbulence, so please fasten your seatbelt. I obey him. He is the authority of the plane. He has more knowledge than me on turbulence and physics and how a plane works. So I buckle up. If I'm so arrogant not to buckle up, I'll hurt my head, right? Allah is the authority not only of the plane and physics, but of everything. So to deny his command is irrational and silly. That's the point. So we have to understand that even if there's a command in the Sharia or, or in Islam that we may feel is wrong, one point, maybe because we don't know the knowledge behind it, we need to study more. But the other point is sometimes we just don't know who Allah is. Allah is Ar Rahman and He is the wise and the merciful, right? And He has the totality of wisdom and knowledge. So when He commands something, it's a derivative of His nature. So His commands are wise and good and merciful, even if you don't understand. And that was shaitan's trick, wasn't it? Shaitan, he said, I'm not going to bow down to Adam. He's made of clay. I'm made of fire. You need fire to bake clay. Right? He thought he was better. He was the first pseudo-rationalist. Because <laughs> he used his limited knowledge experience to deny Allah. But he was the, gr the greatest idiot. Why? Because he denied the ultimate authority. Do you see? So this is a subtle thing. Sometimes we have more doubts because we don't know the knowledge behind these things. And sometimes we have more doubts because we don't know Allah properly. If you really truly know that Allah is the, the wise, the knowing, and He is our Rahman, then whether we understand this moral command or not, we know it's from someone who is infinitely knowing, right? And infinitely merciful. Make sense? That's very important. And many of the accusations on a moral perspective are usually false anyway, because when you study Islam, you see that all of its rulings are based on Rahmah. As Ibn Qayyum al jawziya said that all of the Sharia is based on mercy, is based on compassion. And you see it. Even things that you may think are harsh. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, the lenses you use to understand Islam is mercy. Here's the Dalil. Number one, Allah says He is our Rahman. And He taught the Qur'an. Our Rahman taught the Qur'an. The Qur'an is a love letter to humanity. Number two, Allah says about the Prophet that He is our Rahman to all the worlds, to everything that exists. So these are the two fundamental lenses that we use to understand Islam. So for example, if there was a ruling for the punishment of treachery, right? We see this in the Sirah. This is a political issue. After due process, just law, right? There's a punishment for treachery. That's not harsh, it's mercy. Why? Because if we always allow people to be treacherous against the community, and the community means what? It means Muslim and non-Muslim. It's not just Muslims. If we allow people to be treacherous from a social political level to the community, then that means we're easy target. And it affects everybody. Innocence. So sometimes you have to have a suitably harsh law to create preventative mechanisms, right? So it's in line with a greater wisdom and a greater mercy. My country, Great Britain, right? Imagine France always broke its treaties. Always did skirmishes near the border, killed innocent people. And David Cameron said, oh, we forgive you, France. Oh, we forgive you, France. Oh, we forgive you again. And the fifth time, England becomes France, right? And it's raped and pillaged all the Brits. God forbid, right? Too soft. That's not Rahmah. David Cameron would be really wise and merciful if he said after the second strike, we're going to have a suitably harsh anti-treachery law in place. Do you see my point here? Simple stuff. 
You see it through the eyes of mercy. Don't allow these Islamophobes to try and make our Prophet ﷺ look like someone who was bloodthirsty. He was never bloodthirsty. And we could see this in when people became Muslim, he forgave them, which means that the maqsad, the higher objective was them for their guidance. And that was true love, true compassion. Love for Anas, what you love for yourself, this is in Bukhari, narrated by Bukhari. If you love Allah and His Messenger, then you want to give that love to other people. You want guidance for people. He said, I didn't come here to curse people, right? He came to guide them. He was here as a warner and as someone to show them glad tidings. He forgave people who even tried to attempt to kill him. Right? What about the general amnesty in, in Mecca? Right? You know, we, we, people don't remember these things. The Prophet had a lot of hilm, a lot of forbearance, which is patience against aggression. And the other aspects that we see in the seerah, they have context, they have a social political context which is based on a greater mercy. Right? Because if people always intend to kill others, you have to put preventative mechanisms in place. Right? So we have to be very nuanced and analytical when we look at the, the tradition. Aslan, foundationally, is all mercy. So more doubts can be explained. Then we have egocentric doubts which really link. Egocentric doubts basically means that your perspective is the only perspective. And this links to the spiritual doubts because if you're not spiritually in tune, you're not close to Allah, you don't humble yourself, right? Because what's, what's, what's Salah? Salah is an act of worship but it's also very humbling. Your face is on the ground, it's the symbol of the ego, it's on the floor, you realize you're nothing, Allah is everything, Allah is the greatest, Allahu Akbar, right? Allah is most high. You know, these things to build it to our ego because the ego is a barrier to Allah's mercy and guidance. So sometimes we are so egocentric, it's my way or the highway, right? We were like this all the time. No, Akhi, it's my way, I don't care. It has to be this way because this is it. This is ego, this is egocentrism. And this is also a trick of shaitan that allows doubts to creep in. Because when you may read something like, oh, how can the Prophet say this, right? Oh, how could Allah say this? Without being humble and understanding that there is a perspective, an explanation, or the very fact that if Allah did say it, then therefore it's definitely true, more true than you, and has more mercy behind it than you think. Because it came from the most merciful and the most wise. But yeah, egos, you know, they're, they're, they're so big, aren't they, sometimes? And, and, and unfortunately, in, in our cultures, when I say our, I include Qatar as well, because it's globalization, yeah? It's the celebration of the ego. L'Oreal, because I'm worth it, right? You can do it. Just do it, yeah? Nike, yeah? No limits. <laughs> right, we're trying to make ourselves into God. You can do anything. You can achieve anything. You can do it, right? This is shaitan. It's actually a God complex. We want to become gods in that way. It's, a, it's, it's, it's almost a hidden social shirk. We celebrate people, don't we, all the time. We celebrate ourselves. Selfie, yeah? Yeah, we do it all the time. A lot of people die in the Gulf because of selfies, by the way. Have you, heard, have you seen the accidents? Oh, I'm having such a nice day, alhamdulillah. And then they're dead. SubhanAllah, they die upon that egocentric selfie. Not all selfies are egocentric. But you know what I'm trying to say. It's all about the celebration of me, celebration of I, Facebook, what people are going to think about me, right? And this creates an attitude where, therefore, your feelings and what you think is right is more important what Allah, than what Allah thinks is right. And this forms the ego. But when you do salah and you read Quran, you do dhikr, you belittle the ego, you push the nafs down, right? And that's why the Sahaba were on the highest spiritual level because they would hear and they would obey. We would hear, we would think, discuss, challenge, then not obey. Yeah? But they would hear and obey because they had that, that heart, they were so humbled. They had that tarbiyah. So when they knew something was from Allah and they understood it properly, khalas is done. But us, even when we understand it properly, we still have this ego, what if, what this, what that. Do you see? And that's egocentrism. My way or the highway. I'm right. It's all about me and what I feel. How can Allah challenge my feelings? Yeah? SubhanAllah, this is ego. And we have to challenge this as best as possible. And the way to deal with this is to understand who Allah is. Allah is Al-Wudud. He is the loving. Coming from the word wood, which means the loving that is giving. Right? Allah is Ar-Rahman. And really what Allah tells us is because He loves us. Khalas. 
We have to understand that. And also we have to understand that we have to humble ourselves. Because it's with humility you find your true self. You know, Western spirituality, if you read the spiritual books by Deepak Chopra and stuff, they just add to yourself. You know, increase in uh, speaking skills, in articulation, in confidence, in courage, in motivation, all these things you add to yourself, right? Islam doesn't believe in that. Actually, you remove. The more nothing you become, the more you find who you are. Hajj is a great example. When I went to Hajj two years ago, it was the de-individualization of the self, which means I was thrown into Hajj and I realized I'm absolutely nothing. We're the same flesh and blood with two pieces of white cloth. We're doing the same things with everybody else, eating the same, sleeping the same, doing the same acts of worship. And in that, I almost forgot my name, I forgot my gender, I forgot who I was, I forgot my false delusions about myself, you're a speaker, you're this, you're that, I forgot everything. And in, I unwrapped myself and I found nothing. And in that nothingness, I found the best peace. Wallahi, I found who I was, I was just an abid. You're just a servant, man, that's it. Simple servant of Allah and you just find so much peace. Hajj is my home. The best sleep I've had is in Hajj. Ask my wife. I hardly, I can't sleep properly these days. The best sleep I had was in Mina and Muzdalifah. To the point where the brothers around me, they would take pictures of me and they would call me the sleeping guy. And if you know me, ask my family, I don't sleep in the afternoon. I had the most best sleeps. You know, you're reading, I was reading Surah Al-Hajj, I was falling asleep and khalas, and I wake up and I'm like, okay, ready for salah now or whatever. I'm telling you, I had the best sleeps in Hajj. Best form of tranquility. Because you just remove everything. You remove all these self-delusions about yourself. Even your name, your culture, your ethnicity, who you are, who likes you, who doesn't like you, gossip, this, that, yeah, you remove all your academic ability, this, that, yeah, it all becomes rubbish, nothing, meaningless. And then you just unwrap, you, all this linguistic wrapping, yeah? I'm a boss, I'm a businessman, I'm a father, I'm this, I'm that. Or you just remove yourself and you just find that, but in that nothingness you find who you are, that fitrah. That being that said to his Rabb, that you are my Rabb, yeah? And, that's, and then you find Sakina and peace. So that's what Islamic spirituality is really, you just remove. That's what the, what's the Salah about? Yes, it's because we do it because Allah deserves to be worshipped. But look at the kind of wisdom behind it as well. Allahu Akbar, world is nothing, right? Allah is greater. Allah is higher than me, higher than anything, greater than anything. Allah transcends everything. Right? And the moment you lose your spiritual balance, when you think you're somebody, you think, you know, I just finished my postgrad and after my three hour exam, non stop writing, I had a blister. Yeah? I still got a bit of a bump, yeah? Non stop writing, yeah? I was so like, put everything in this to do the essays perfectly and to do the exam and studying. I mean, I've never studied so much in my life, yeah? And when I finished, I felt so ungrateful. Wallahi, I felt so ungrateful to Allah Because I lost myself in the process of studying Because I thought, I can do it It's me, but then I realized when I finished This would have been impossible without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It would have been impossible without Him The other day I was in the office and I put my feet up We shouldn't really do that, but I was tired yeah. I put my feet up, I had brown boots on And sometimes these things hit you, it's not from you, they just hit you And I just saw my brown boots and you know what I said to myself? SubhanAllah, I can see my brown boots. I know that sounds really weird, but the very concept that I can see, I just found it so profound. I was like, Allah Akbar, have I even been grateful for my sight? I know that sounds a bit like a spiritual cliche, but it just hit me, you know? Because sometimes we think, I deserve sight. Do you see my point? We think we deserve this. SubhanAllah, if you put all the best deeds in the world for a lifetime, and you balance them to your eyesight, you won't go to Jannah. And sometimes the ego, right? The egocentric reality of yourself basically makes you think that I deserve these things. But you don't. And I was like, SubhanAllah, when was the last time I said, Alhamdulillah, for the fact that I can even see, I can see my kids. SubhanAllah, it's just, it's just, just the concept of sight has really hit me. 
Sorry for these experiences, but I just want to try to bring the point home. So finally, brothers and sisters, we have the, the final source of doubt, which is just whisperings. You know what? Don't allow shaitan to use your own voice against you. Whisperings are probably the most predominant type of doubt. These doubts should just be ignored. Allow them to pass like clouds. And I'm just going to talk to you about what Ibn Taymiyyah spoke about this. And he mentions the hadith in what, he, what, we're saying, what he's saying right now. In his Kitab al-Iman, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him, said in his Kitab al-Iman, the believer may suffer from the whispers of shaitan, of the shaitan insinuating thoughts of kufr, disbelief, which may make him feel distressed. The Sahaba, may Allah be pleased with them, said, O Messenger of Allah, some of us think thoughts which we would rather fall from heaven to earth than speak of them. He وسلم, said, that is a clear sign of faith. According to one report, thoughts which are too terrible to speak of. He said, praise be to Allah who has reduced all of shaitan's plots to mere whispers. Meaning that the fact that these whispers come, but they are so greatly disliked and they are pushed away from the heart is a clear sign of faith. As Allah says in the Quran, as sorry, as the Prophet وسلم, said, Allah will forgive my ummah for any insinuating whispers that may cross their minds so long as they do not act upon it or speak on it. So the condition is from these fleeting whispering thoughts, ignore it, don't speak about it, don't act upon it. Alright? And you know the whispering thoughts because your heart hates it. Right? So that's different from intellectual doubts and social doubts. We've discussed those. But the main type of doubt for the believer, generally speaking, is this whispering, insinuating thoughts, right? And again, you, you get strengthened by more dhikr and more reading Qur'an and strengthening your spiritual activities, doing more sunnah, because these are things that, you know, protect the heart. And if you remove them, your heart has less protection. So, that's it. That's, that's everything. I think I've done everything I can. Uh, it's not everything, obviously. Speak to your ulama and your students of knowledge to basically, you know, learn more about this, I just try to plant some seeds in your heart. Let me just summarize, it's very important to summarize. We basically spoke about what is Iman, the different levels of Yaqeen, of certainty, right? We also said that just because you don't know how to prove something, it doesn't mean it's not true. Gave the example about your mother being your mother, right? And we discussed basically there's nothing wrong with questioning, it's part of our tradition, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, when you question the furu, the, the branches of faith or some moral fiqh issues, it's not a problem. Ulama question them all the time. But what we don't question, we know that's true, is the foundations, which is the fact that Allah exists, He deserves to be worshipped. And we talked about the fitrah and the role of the fitrah based on the self-evident truth that we said to Allah that He is our Lord. The fitrah is a capacity that, that brings that forward, brings that self-evident truth forward. We don't start with doubt, we start with knowledge and end with knowledge. We don't start with doubt and end with knowledge. And the ayat in the Quran about natural phenomena are there to act as trigger points to awaken the fitra so the self-evident truth could shine, right? So our epistemology, our study of knowledge is basically that we have the fitra and reason, revelation, sound reason, revelation, experiences, right? Sunnah. They act as trigger points to awaken the fitrah so the self-evident truth could shine through. And I gave the example of Donald Duck, right? Known from a known. I knew it was my favorite toy when I was five, then I forgot about it. When I'm 35, I'm in the basement, I find it, I go, oh yeah. So it's a known to a known, right? It's not an unknown to a known or a known to an unknown. We start with truth and we end with truth. Unlike the skeptical tradition, which starts with Doubt and ends with more doubt sometimes, yeah? So, then we just discussed the different types of doubts, intellectual doubts. We talked about science can never deny God's existence, the problem of induction, realism, anti-realism, instrumentalism. They all believe that science can be defeasible, theories can change, right? So it's not certainty. There's no certainty, so don't worry about it, yeah? And we also discussed social doubts. Moral doubts, egocentric doubts, spiritual doubts, which is the most important. 90% in my view, I give some examples from my life interaction, my engagements. And then we talked about whisperings, 
MashaAllah, you guys were on, on point. Just, just no more whisperings from the shaitan. Ignore them, don't speak about them. Increase the spirituality and you'll be fine. So hopefully this um, has dealt with everything. And don't forget, you know, don't forget the, how, to, how to deal with the causes of these doubts. For example, when it came to the moral doubts, remember, understand you to gain more knowledge about certain aspects of Islam. Because sometimes we think something is immoral, but when we know more about it, it's like, oh my God, amazing. It awakens you. And also, if you understand who Allah is, where did it come from? It came from Al-Hakim, the one who has totality of wisdom and knowledge, the one who is the most merciful. So his commands are derivative of his own nature, which is merciful, knowing, wise. So therefore, these commands have absolute knowledge and wisdom and mercy behind it, right? So these are some of the solutions to the causes of these doubts. So remember the kind of what the doubt was and what the solution was, right? And that would help you in your journey and it would help you talking to other people. Anyway, so I'm done. Sorry for such a lengthy time, but I thought it was very important for us to discuss these issues. Uh, may Allah bless you with Jonathan Firdaus. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you united. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and just, you know, make dua for brother Abu Huraira. We just came from his daughter's janazah. His daughter was four years old and she passed away. You know, there is a sense of sakina from the point of view that we know children go to paradise and they wait for their parents calling them at the doors of Jannah so you know if you see the brother I saw him give him a kiss just remind him of Jannah remind him if he's patient and his family's patient they will get Jannah too and it's very hard you know sometimes we can't even empathize because this is a test that is such a huge test but it's also a sign of Allah's love Allah loves those who he tests and he's such an amazing brother who's very very strong um, and his family, a great family, the all great family. So just make dua for that family, please. Uh, make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant some patience and sakina, that this is a means for their jannah. And uh, to stay united and support the brother, please, inshallah, yeah. You know, that's your duty. You know, we're mirrors of each other. Al mu'minu miratul mu'min. We are one body, we're a brotherhood, a sisterhood. You know, go beyond the call of duty, yeah. You know, we have it easy in Qatar, some of us, architects, lawyers, engineers, accountants. Yeah, there's dunya here, yeah. Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed you. But use that blessing, yeah. You know, Allah has blessed you a lot. You know, you don't live in, in, uh, in the, you don't live in the third world, London. How are you joking? <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, you know, you know, you have everything that you need, mashallah. May Allah bless it and preserve it. But, you know, understand your blessings and support the brothers, okay? Everybody. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum wa